a little bit about what we're going to talk about. We're going to do company and project background, then why do we have to change, a little bit on predictability, and then most of you know OE is something different in the TOC world. Well, in nuclear, we create our own acronyms for everything, and for us, OE is operating experience, and what we're going to talk about is our operating experience or lessons learned, and then the path forward. So who are we? Well, Duke Energy is a big energy company. We do about $30 billion a year in revenue. And relative to the nuclear side, we've got three nuclear assets. You can see them. This is our McGuire nuclear station, Oconee nuclear station, and Catawba nuclear station. They're located in North and South Carolina, generate about 7,000 megawatts of power. It represents about half of the power that we generate to our power grid locally. Duke has overall an excellent reputation in the industry. We have capacity factors over 90%, which means that most of the time our plants are online. And the only time that they should go down is when we have a 18-month refueling cycle, and it's about a 30-day window where they go down for maintenance. It's supposed to be 30 days. We're going to work on that. In any case, the point here is that if we lose a day of throughput on one of those plants, it hurts in the pocketbook in a major way. It's about a million dollars a day for each unit that goes down. So that's really important to keep those units up and online, and that feeds into why we're doing what we do, which is upgrade the plants and make sure that they're capable of running and performing at the highest levels. We've got about 40 licensed years left of operation. They've already been going for 20, so now 40 more. That's a whole lot of time to make sure that we can generate good power cheaply and reliably and safely. This one in planning up there that we talk about, that's this design right here. That's the AP1000. That's a new reactor that we're trying to get a license to build. And if we can get that license and we can build that plant, then we will be able to generate a lot more power and keep our customers' costs very low for a significant period of time. Our rates are about 20% below the national average, which I guess if you looked at the paper today, you saw that Chicago's rates actually aren't too good. Anyway. So that's kind of what's coming. Let's talk about the program that we're doing. This is a distributed control system upgrade program. And what we do is we take all this equipment that's in our nuclear plant that's been proven for years to work. It's 60s and 70s technology. It works very well, but it's very analog, which means that when it does break, it's very time consuming to fix. And troubleshooting can be a real pain in the neck. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve some problems with this system. We're going to solve our obsolescence issues. We're going to improve our plant reliability. We're also going to give ourselves an infrastructure for future upgrades. We have lots of things that we want to do to upgrade our plants, but you have to put a backbone digital infrastructure in place first. Once that's there, then you can start adding in alarms and rod control systems and all these other pieces that right now are analog. Bridging the AP1000 technology gap, that is critical to us. If we're going to put a new plan online in 2015, we don't want that to be the first time where we've operated it. In reality, what we want to do is retrofit our existing plants so that we have the capability to go into that new plant and say, oh, we already know how to do this because we've been doing it on our old plants for about seven or eight years now. The system we're putting in will be the same system that controls the new plant. To give you an idea of size, it's about a $50 million project. It spans about four years. It's mostly design work. And Westinghouse is our primary vendor. So we often talk about schedule interaction, and we're on a critical chain system. They're not. So it's been very interesting dynamic as we look at milestones and how you structure things and the payment sequences, all the problems that we all face in projects. So why change? Now, I debated putting this up here because there's a lot of data there. And really, I want you to ignore the data and just focus on the colors. What this is is this shows how our modification engineering group is doing. What color do you see, mostly? Red. <laughs> exactly. We're not doing so hot. We have an engineering work management tool that is used. And just to pick out some highlights, let's take our modification milestone schedule adherence. So in order to get a modification developed and put in when we want it to, we built schedules. And you can see we adhere to them just like the industry standard for not using critical chain about half the time, maybe 3 quarters if we're really good. In any case, we don't meet our own internal expectations. The real focus is team loading percentage. This is your quality of life for your people. 
And right now, our people don't have a very good quality of life. 160% team loading is the minimum that you see down there. Goes up to, at Catawba, 217% on average. It's just not possible. It's not a way to sustain operations. Maybe for a short period of time, with overtime, you could do it. But it's been like this for years. As long as I've been in the company, which has been four and a half years, the measures have looked about like this. One other thing that you see on here that's important is we do track everyone's time explicitly. So what you see is how much time is charged to this thing called LOE, or level of effort. It's about 30 to 40% of the time. Now, what is level of effort? It means it's not whatever we're actually hired you to do. It's just all the filler stuff. Okay. So if you look at how long a modification engineer actually spends working on a modification, it's less than half their time. The rest of their time, they're working on things that aren't related to improving the plants. That's not what we hired them to do. Clearly, it's a system problem. One of the other reasons I point this out is when you talk to senior management and try to get them to buy into your change, part of the buy-in is making them recognize that you have a problem. And it's real easy to feel pain and show pain when you have data like this and you say, look, we keep trying improvements. We keep trying to work harder. And instead of working harder, all we do is get maybe 5% better, maybe 10% worse. Let's try something different that maybe could work. The other problem, though, with this, it's a double-edged sword. Because we have experience and because we've been working for so long in this system, we develop something that maybe doesn't help us going forward, and that's bad intuition. We make some underlying assumptions. So when you go to your senior managers and you tell them, we're going to institute this new system, and you can explain all the logic, and they'll believe the logic, and then all of a sudden you say, so what throughput gains can you expect? And we've been doing the benchmarking, we know. We say 30%, 40%. And that's when the flag goes up. And they say, wait a second, there is no free lunch. What's the catch? It's a free lunch problem. Okay? An analogy you might use, and this is why I'm wearing this tie. This is my uh, formerly favorite physicist. I don't think they have a Dr. Goldratt tie. This is an Albert Einstein tie. Okay? E equals mc squared. How many people truly understand E equals mc squared? I mean, really, the whole theory of relativity. Does anybody? I don't know. There's probably a couple in the world who really understand it very well. Most of us have a decent grasp, and then the rest of us, we press that I believe button. I believe e equals mc squared. OK. But the fact is, is it works. We make money from e equals mc squared every single day. So you don't have to understand all the intricacies behind the theory, but you do have to at least be able to press a little bit of an I believe button and say, if the system we set up before is consistently giving us these results across the board, and now we have new evidence that a new system can provide better benefit, maybe it isn't a free lunch. Maybe in reality, it's just that we have this underlying assumption that is wrong. So it's not free lunch. And that's something that I had to overcome with our senior management, and we're still trying to overcome. The other one is, it doesn't apply to us. They always say, well, our environment is unique. After all, we're nuclear power, so no one else has to take care of public health and safety, do they? Right? Not, not a single one of you does that. No one else works under the pressures that we do. We have a regulator. None of you have regulators you report to, right? OK. We have bosses that have budgets. We have to meet those budget targets. I'm sure none of you have that either. So on top of all that, they say, well, we learned about this Parkinson's law. And that sounds nice in theory. And it makes sense in theory. But does it really apply to us? Well, Jimmy Jones went and pulled the data. <laughs> nice thing about a nuclear plant is we have data on everything. We have a histogram here of 3,053 project tasks at Catawba from June of 2000 until October 2005. On the left axis is frequency, and then the bottom axis is a ratio of the actual time charged to a task versus what we originally estimated and put into the schedule. So a ratio of 1 would mean that the task took exactly as long as I planned, Parkinson's law. And you'll notice a nice big peak at 1. So we clearly have Parkinson's law. What you'll also see, though, is we have a big peak at about 0.1. Now, what does that mean? It means one of two things. Either first, the task 
really didn't need to be in there to begin with, and if we had done a better job looking at the network and figuring out what needed to be done on the project, really that task didn't need to be done, and we just had this template that's arbitrary, we put it in, and if we would better look at what the work is, maybe we wouldn't need those tasks in the network. The second thing is, maybe our people are just charging to something else, and then when they get to that task, the work is actually done, but they've already charged their time somewhere else, so they just did that. The other part you see is the effect of student syndrome, which is at the very end, the greater than two. So this took 200 time or 200% longer than what we were thinking it was going to take. And you can see a huge hump over there. So what that tells you is we have all the symptoms that make us a viable candidate for in implementing critical chain. And when you can show senior management this sort of data, it becomes a lot easier to convince them to at least let you give it a try. So why use it now? We have three main reasons. The first one has to do with what I'd call the apple pie and motherhood reasons that we've used. Transparency, predictability, and throughput. The problem when you're getting started is it takes you a while to demonstrate the throughput gains. You have to get projects in the system and going and executing. And for projects that are four months long or a year long, you just have to get going in order to show a viable throughput gain. And you can't take two weeks later and say, look, see, it's at 5% completion and 4% buffer consumed. We're doing well. No one believes you. You've got to wait until you have projects going. So in the interim, what do you say to senior management to say, look, we can use some other benefits here. The first one, transparency. How many of you in your organizations, when you want to find out how a project's going in traditional organization, you have to go find the project manager? So you go find him. And then he says, oh, I don't know. Let me go see the task manager. So he walks over and goes find the task manager. And it takes you, what, an hour, two hours to find out the answer to probably a simple question? So when we showed our senior VPs the fact that they could, in about six clicks, drill down to as far as they wanted into the task level, if they wanted to know what was stuck, they liked that. That's transparency. Downside of transparency is as an individual contributor, normally you're not used to that kind of visibility. So that takes, it's a two-way street, and you can't abuse that from the top. So we did a little bit of coaching with our senior managers that just because you see something, still work through the chain in order to take some actions. Don't just jump down to that lower resource if you can avoid it. Predictability. I'll get more into this later, but we have a lot of projects that weren't finishing when we wanted them to. And even more importantly for us, we have these outage windows that are 18 months uh, apart. So like for our project, if we don't get our project in in that one four-week window of that outage, for some reason if we're late, what happens? How long is the project delayed? 18 months. If we're a day late in order to make that window, we're not going to be a day late on the project. We're going to be an 18-month delay. Now, in reality, they might extend the outage a little bit for us, but I doubt it. And an 18-month delay is huge because that means we have more equipment that could have been fixed and could be more reliable, and instead, we risk having our plant go down for a day or two days as a result of an equipment malfunction that this system easily takes care of. The throughput gains, as they come, we just got ours uh, and did the real analysis about a week ago. We had enough data now, six months of runtime, to show senior management our 30% throughput gains. And it's now believable. We haven't finished a project yet, but we're close. We're about a week away. Our program organization, if you look, we're a combination of core resources. We have about five resources at McGuire and six at Catawba that are dedicated, fully assigned to the project team. Everyone else is matrixed in. We have about 15 matrix resources at each site. So we're talking with that and a PM team of about five people, a total of about 50 people. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. With all of that and the fact that we have about 15 sub-projects at each site, it's a whole lot to manage, and we couldn't see any other way but using critical chain. One other thing that we've required is that both sites be consistent. That way you have a standardized product. It makes things a lot easier on implementation and also on follow-through maintenance. If you have consistency between your nuclear sites, you can share resources. The downside to that is our sites are staggered as to when their outages are. So in some cases, we've made McGuire's resources work on an issue that would affect both McGuire and Catawba. But it benefits Catawba because they're going first. And McGuire's schedules actually suffer a little bit to get that consistency benefit. 
And the third one we've already talked about, why use it now? Quality of life. So now let's talk about predictability and quantifying hunches. I put this graph up here to make a point, and that's that when you're getting started, don't be afraid to learn, don't be afraid to make mistakes. And this is the clean version of the graph. This is the monthly. If you look at the weekly version, it's very, very interesting. Uh, we, we actually have some dots over here in the negatives, which took us a while to figure out how you could actually go negative on a project. But we, we managed to do it. <laughs> when we did the initial project planning, we started just with our Catawba. We called it our main mod, our di distributed control system main mod that we're doing with Westinghouse, the vendor. We planned this project out. And the first time we entered in the system, remember, our milestone is to get it in in 2008. And it showed us getting it in by, what, 2012? So that didn't work. So we did a lot of replanning. And then we call what I call our initial planning result is that dot at 67% 67 buff 67 buffer consumed at the start of the project. Hadn't done a day of work, and we're already 67% buffer consumption. That scared us. But it also validated a really key point to senior management, which is predictability and early warning. We said, we have a problem. And even though this project isn't due for two years, we're telling you about it today. We're also telling you we're going to fix it, because now we know what to do. So what did we do? We replanned the project. And how much did we buck when realization told us, replan your network? We hated replanning the network. We didn't want to do it. So we didn't do it. And then after a little while, we gave in and realized we had to replan our project. The other thing that we did is we better quantified our resource needs. We played what if, and that enabled us to scale our team appropriately so we could get the project done on time. And as of our week 24, basically uh, where we're at right now, 15% buffer consumed, 25% of our longest chain complete, and actually we're projecting to finish three weeks early. Now, we all know that that date is worthless because it's going to move, but it looks nice. All 30 of our projects, what do we learn about predictability here? Pipelining. We had 10 projects of those 30 that didn't initially fit their desired due dates. We're working on redeveloping those networks and figuring out resource constraints so that we can make them fit. Or maybe say, this doesn't need to be done now. Let's push it out. In terms of using our buffers, we've been able to use them to resolve emergent impacts. We've had people, key, key resources, pulled to do root cause analysis on things that are, go wrong at the plant. We've had work prioritization and reprioritization that we've been able to do from this. We've been able to report program progress very effectively, show how we can better allocate our resources, that early warning system, and then my favorite, which is buffer recovery and recovery monitoring. We haven't figured that one out yet. We're getting there in terms of how to recover buffer, but we're just early on in that process. It was also very hard because we started in buffer recovery from day one on a few of the projects. And now we're getting to the point where actually we have some projects that actually start like they're supposed to at the bottom left and then slowly work up so you do have time to get to the problems. OK, a little OE. First thing, never lose sight of the goal. Don't get bogged down in all the details of Concerto when you talk to your managers. It's real easy to get dragged into the fight. Does it do this? Does it do that? Blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. What it does, very simply, is get the right resource working on the right task at the right time. That's it. And from the management level, it allows you to make decisions that ensure the right resource gets the right task at the right time. It's that simple. Everything else is all a lot of magic that goes on behind the scenes. But fundamentally, that's all it's about. And if you can keep that in mind, you can avoid getting dragged into a lot of these discussions that really are kind of irrelevant in some cases. Network fidelity, how much detail do we go into? We talked a lot about this yesterday, some too much, some too little. One rule that I would add that we used is think about your capacity to estimate within plus or minus 50%. And what we looked at is for some tasks that started out as maybe a six-month task in our old template, we knew that that was ridiculous. But is two days and a series of two-day tasks too short for engineers who are very independently minded? Probably. So what we tried to do is compromise and come down to a situation where an engineer could be working and also have at least a reasonable degree of accuracy to tell us, I think I've got five days left or 10 days left. Now, if you have a three-month task and you're a week into it, 
How good's your estimate? Probably not that good, unless you've done this task 100 times. So because of that, we think that that's one rule that you should apply is take the remaining duration that your resources have the capability to accurately estimate, and you focus that in to your plans. And that's how you should help define your task durations. And it's going to depend on your organization and what jobs they're doing. Some resources, if it's a two-hour job, then maybe, and you're scheduling that level of detail, maybe it's like outage management, then that might be different than what we're doing. Culture change really is an effect. We've done, on a scale of 1 to 10 in terms of our implementation, I'd give us about a 4 or 5 in terms of how well we implemented. And that's maybe a little high, maybe it's a 3. But the fact is, is even with mediocre adherence to what we were asking, because we reduced the picture that our resources saw, they had lower WIP, they were still, even though we were, they were still jumping a little bit too much between the tasks, we still got more done. Concerto has really helped us for, focus those priority decisions and supervisory engagement. Reality isn't always green. And that's something that's been hard for us because in our culture, if it's not green, then that, oh, all sorts of flags go off. That must be a nuclear safety issue. And in this case, it's not. It's just diagnostics. Predictive red is better than reactive red. It's always better to be red knowing you can do something about it than to be red and can't do anything about it. One of, one of the things that we've noticed is our, our bosses, they don't have these. Okay, you, you put on your throughput glasses and you see the world differently, right? How many of you see the world differently with your throughput glasses on? Okay. Well, our bosses don't have these. All they see is these charts with red, yellow, and green, and they've been trained their entire lives that green is good, yellow you better worry, and red is bad. One of the things we're talking about doing is figuring out how to change our buffer charts that we show them so they still learn the concept of buffers, but instead we make yellow move it up a little bit and then make yellow be plan and act, and then we stop the yellow at 100% and then start red. And by moving yellow up a little bit, we avoid making a type 1 error potentially acting when we shouldn't act. And that's something we're considering. I don't know. I'd be interested in getting opinions on that. But our management has had a lot of trouble grasping. And as soon as they see red, they go, ooh, that's really bad. And we have to retrain them. Flywheels, hijackers, and grenades. Borrowing the flywheel concept from Jim Collins. Your culture is a flywheel. Once you get it turned in the direction you want, this can take off. And that's what we're starting to see. Our flywheel is starting to move. But it's taken a lot of effort. We've had hijackers. We've had people who they have a vested interest in not changing. And it could be because their job depends on maintaining the old system. And so they throw all these, I call them grenades, but oh, can you do this? Can you do cost accounting with that? What about our PIP program? Does that interface with it? And trying to manage all that, what we've tried to do is put in our project plan for implementation. We said, look, these are all important issues. They need to be addressed, but as part of the overall pilot, not to not do the pilot, because we know we have the right thing to do here. The other thing we do is we have a football. This is a critical chain football. You see. Our task, our project that's most read. We take the project that's most read and the highest priority task on that project that's most read, and we give it to that guy, and it sits on his desk. And what this means is you don't invite that guy to the FYI meetings that people have. You don't bother him. If you're working on a task and he's working on the task, and all of a sudden he says, I need your help, guess who's dropping their task to go help who? Football, priority. It's visible. They see it. Then it passes. Relay runner to relay runner. And this is how we manage for those higher projects to help ensure that we get the results we want. Last thing we did was we started a TOC working group to try to bring the gospel, so to speak, to some of the rest of the company. And we invited our friends in different departments and just started talking about what we were doing. And they started talking about what they were doing. So our calibration and standards lab, uh, Dean Williams, he had to leave, but he was here. They've made like 100% throughput gain in about three months. It's just phenomenal. And they haven't used critical chain at all, just TOC. So you don't need software or anything in certain instances to even make those gains. And it's important to share that information and get people from different parts of your company involved. We have economic developers, marketers, all sorts of things in our group. And that helps us build momentum so we can point to other successes to build the case. So the path forward, we want to finish our project. We want to fully implement critical chain in our modification engineering group at Catawba. 
And more importantly, and this actually we started with this, is all the follow-on things. You know, where can it go and grow to? We started actually with our chief nuclear officer at the very top and said, if you want to build that new plant instead of in five years or ten years, what about three? How much would that be worth since it's a six billion dollar plant? The sooner you can get that online, that's a really good benefit. Even the government's chipping in about a half a billion dollars a plant for the first few that come online. Huge benefits to finishing early. So a lot of motivation to make this work. And really, I just want you to remember predictability, transparency, and throughput gains. You can do it. We're doing it. And I'll entertain any questions.